Delaware is on the brink of passing a regulation that would allow children to change their gender without parental permission or even knowledge. Regulation 225 would order all schools to let kids pick their bathroom, locker room, sports team, preferred name, regardless of their biological gender. The regulation would also let students choose their own race. And if the school wishes, parents will be told nothing. Mark Papora is president of Equality Delaware Foundation, and he joins us today. Mark, thanks for coming on. Hi, Tucker. Thank you for having me. So um, we don't let kids really make any decisions without their parents because their parents are in charge of them. Why would they be encouraged to make a decision this profound without letting their parents know? Well, Tucker, uh, the regulation doesn't encourage children to make any decision. It simply allows them to uh, identify their gender or their race uh, for school records purposes. Uh, the school is permitted under the regulation to seek the permission of parents uh, before they make that change. Um, and, it, and it suggests also that if the uh, school decides to seek the permission of the parents, that they consider the health, safety, and well-being of the child before they do that. The sad okay, but reality, wait, but, Tucker, wait, but, but hold on, wait, but the school is not the parents. The teachers didn't give birth to the child, haven't raised the child. How could teachers justify not telling parents under, why are they not required to tell parents immediately? Sure, Tucker. Um, the simple fact is that some parents are uh, simply not going to be supportive of their child and it may endanger the child's safety or well-being to involve that parent uh, um, in that uh, in that uh, who makes that decision? that decision who makes that decision well the school would make the decision but I think what's missing here is that um, no what's missing uh, here is outrage so let me supply some the school has okay, no so right to take away parental decision making from parents the children do not belong to school administrators. They are members of the family from which they came. How dare a school take that prerogative away from parents? Where do they get the right to do that? Tucker, Tucker they're not taking the prerogative away from parents. Well, obviously they are. First of, first of all, it, it's only in rare circumstances that a school would come to a determination that involving the parent is going to endanger the safety and well-being of the child. But who has we the right all... to decide that? Hold on, Wait, slow down. Who has the right to decide that and where does that right come from? Where does a school well, administrator Tucker, have the right to override parental judgment in the case of a child? Tucker, it's not, a, it's not about overriding parental judgment. Well, of course it's it about, is. It, no, it's about protecting the safety and well-being of that child. Says who on the basis child, of what? A Wait, child, hold on, this is it. Hold on, a slow down. Child, I'm a parent, oh, stop. I'm a parent of four, I can tell you, the most sacrosanct right you have as a parent is to influence the development of your child. In order to violate that right, you need a court order. But you're saying that a school official can just decide it's not in the child's interest, and I'm asking you where you get the right to violate millennia of sacred tradition and make that decision in place of a parent. Simple question. Where's that right come from? Tucker, the child has a right to dignity and respect in school, and they shouldn't have to choose between that dignity and respect and being unsafe at home, being subject to potential physical violence, mental anguish. But somebody or has even to make worse, the decision about, hold on, somebody has to make the decision. There's a subjective decision to be made about what's best for the child. And that decision is always made by parents unless a court determines that the parents are unable to make the right decision. It takes a no, court Tucker, to do that. Tucker, yes, yes. We, we, send, we send children to schools and, and administrators and teachers make those decisions every day. About what and so, race and sex the child is? Are you joking? No, this Tucker, has never no, been tried in any place in the world. Tucker, and for you to pretend Tucker, it's no big deal and that nobody's rights are getting violated, yes, they are. Parental rights are being ignored because of political extremists, I hate to put you in that category, who think their views are more important than the rights of parents. And I think Tucker, we should at least this, acknowledge this that. Regulation, this regulation is similar to, uh, to policies that have been implemented across the country in Oregon and Washington and Massachusetts. Oh, going and back Washington, like about six months. This has never happened no, in Tucker. human history. We didn't Tucker, used to believe three is... years ago that you could change your sex or your race. So this is all brand new. So at least pay me the compliment of acknowledging this is brand new. This has never it's been tried. It's not brand new. Yes, Tucker, it, it's not brand new. Changing four your race ago... is, a, is an old thing. Well, how, how, back, how far back does that extend? What, what, Tucker, tell me the history. Not, is that in British common law? Like, what are you not, talking about? It's not changing your race, Tucker. It's yes, identifying your it. race. It's okay. identifying your race. Okay, look, the, we, not, we're not having a biology conversation. That's another segment. But I'm just telling you as a factual matter, no society has ever done that until very, very recently. It's never happened. So at least Tucker, acknowledge this is brand it's happening, new. 
it's happening in school districts and it's being implemented seamlessly across school districts across the country. But the rights of parents it's, it's over their own not, children are being violated no, because of activists. And I'm going to stand up and say it. I don't care. I'm not afraid of you. And I think it's fair to say that parents are losing their rights in this over their own children. And I think that that's something we need to think about. And I'm sorry Tucker, you disagree. I think that we, we are on the same page that parental involvement is very important. It's only in very rare circumstances. In but which who makes that decision? And where do they get the right to make that decision? I don't know if you have children, but can I just say, you know, I don't like the way you're parenting. And I think it's really in the child's interest to not let you know about a profound life decision that kid is making. I don't this, think you'd like that. Not, I think this, you'd need a court order is, to do that. This does not prohibit communication between the parent and the child. The school at home, hides this from the parent. They have an obligation. They're not their children. Those children do not belong to the school. They belong to the family from which they came. I, Tucker, I just wish you would acknowledge that, and we could like move from there, but you won't. And you try to bully Tucker, people into going along with it, and I won't be. There are, pl there are plenty of circumstances, Tucker, where okay. uh, school counselors or other yeah. people well, they don't engage get, they don't, in conversations. You know, it's not their child. A school counselor doesn't get to decide. We're going to have to stop there. Mark, the Transgender for Legal Defense and Education Fund after the guidelines retraction. Weiss denounced the administration's states' rights position as nonsense. Jillian Weiss joins us now. Jillian, thanks a lot for coming on. Thank you for having me. So I believe, for whatever it's worth, in politeness and decency and not making people uncomfortable, especially children. I have four. But I also believe in honesty. And so I just want to get to what exactly this means. So I'm a 47-year-old man. I think that's pretty obvious. If I were to decide tomorrow that I was a 47-year-old woman, should I be allowed to go shower in a women's locker room? The idea that there's no objective factors to be considered in uh, who is transgender and how we determine bathroom use is really not the way that this works. The okay. fact is that people make this decision after a lot of serious consideration. They see medical doctors, there is psychologists involved, um, there's a lot to think about. It's not an easy process. As someone who's gone through that, right. I can tell you, you just don't decide tomorrow. So okay, that's really what, not the way it works. But what if, what if I did decide tomorrow? What, well, what, what should I be? And, I, and it was totally sincere. Or by the way, how would you know whether it was sincere or not? Or anyone? No, only I can make that decision. And what if I did? Would well, I be allowed to go and shower in a women's locker room? And if not, why not? <laughs> Well, I think the answer is no. And for example, we have the Gavin Grimm case, which, as you know, is coming up to the Supreme Court very soon. The ACLU just put out its brief in that uh, case. And, you know, they went through what he had to address. He changed his name. He had medical doctors. He had letters from psychologists and so on. It wasn't the kind of thing where he just came in and said, oh, uh, now I'm uh, going to be using the, the boys' room. So Okay, so but let's go through just, I mean, because there's a lot at stake here, is the, and you know this because you do it for a living. There's a lot of money at stake, and there's a lot bigger issues at stake, the definition of gender itself, which is at the center of any society. So what are the absolute standards that are required for a person to change his or her sex? There is an organization called the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, which has a series of standards of care. We're on uh, number seven now, or, or eight is coming up. Um, and so this is uh, something that doctors and medical people, psychologists have worked with for years, and there is a whole protocol. Um, so, I mean, I, I can't give you the entire thing right now, but I think it's important to understand that there is uh, something called transgender, and we have been here forever. We've been going to the bathroom forever. Oh, but um, I'm not contesting any of. I'm not contesting yeah. any of that. And just, just to be totally clear, I'm not attacking anyone. Yes. But I think it's fair because so much is at stake to get much more precise than you are getting. So, what exactly are the standards, and are they legal standards, or are they standards that you agree with? I mean, what exactly? are the, stand the actual standards? Because again, a lot of money is at stake here. Yes. Well, the medical standards um, require uh, seeing a therapist for a certain period of time before uh, cross-sex hormones will be prescribed, uh, a certain amount of time living uh, as the opposite sex before um, certain kinds of medical treatment and surgery will be permitted. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that the courts have been parsing this for the last 15, 20 years. And so if uh, somebody is being stereotyped because of their sex, because they're not perceived to fit in with appropriate masculinity or femininity because of whatever people perceive as their birth sex, uh, that is something that's prohibited by the uh, okay, anti-discrimination statute. Right, so that's the anti-discrimination statute, but you still haven't explained, I've, and I've asked you a bunch, 
what the, the legal standards are, because I don't think that there are any, and here's why that's a concern. So we spend, the federal government spends over $11 billion every year on sex-specific programs, and I'm sure you know what they are. The Small Business Administration, among many others, gives a ton of money to people because they are women. And so how are we supposed to navigate that if there, and let's be honest with each other, there are no standards actually, other than I say that I'm uh, of a different sex. How are we supposed to navigate this and what's going to prevent charlatans from jumping in and taking all that cash? Well, let me give you an example. In the field of athletics, there are standards that have been developed for when someone is permitted to move into a sp particular single sex activity. It involves how long they've been on hormones, how long their transition has been, you know, whether or not they have the strength equivalent to, you know, that uh, like in women's sports for example. So there are standards that have been developed. Now I don't know all of the details of that exactly. But well, you're asking for there example, is no how do we absolute standard that's well, been developed as you know? I mean, look, you this is your job. You know that there actually that's not true. There isn't. The WNBA doesn't have the same standard as the Olympics, as Notre Dame women's field hockey. I mean, there is no absolute standard. Well, if that's what you're saying, is there an absolute standard? You're correct. Yeah. There is not an absolute standard. We are working this out as a society. It doesn't mean put transgender people back in the closet or tell transgender youth just, you know, fend for yourself. But nobody's suggesting that, at least on this show. What I'm okay. suggesting is an adult look at this issue. And yet, whenever you bring it up, like, what does this really mean? And can you actually change your sex biologically? You're denounced, as you know, as like a hater. And I'm just speaking for myself when I say that has nothing to do with it. I think it's fair to ask these questions. And so when are we going to find out exactly what it means to be a woman or a man? Let me just suggest this. I have a list here of 25 studies that have been done over the last 15 years by scientists, peer-reviewed journals discussing exactly what it means to be transgender, when someone is transitioning, the difference in the basal ganglia of the stria terminalis, the neuron density in the brain and so on. I'm sorry for being very technical. The point is there are biological <laughs> differences. You're big. I mean, let me ask you this. Can, if a, I mean, can you uh, ascertain a person's sex with a blood test throughout life from birth until death? And will that result remain consistent? Blood, no, not with a blood test. Not with a blood test. Okay, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if that's correct, actually. But the okay, point is, well, look, do you agree that, and this is, I'll, we'll just leave it here, but do you agree that until there is a commonly recognized, legally recognized standard for sex, what constitutes a man and a woman, that we ought to slow down a little bit, stop building up all these anti-discrimination statutes before we can agree on who is being discriminated against, who meets the standard? We've had, these, we? we've had these laws in the books for the past, you know, 40 years. They have come to understand that this includes transgender people. For the last 15 years, we're all over society. We are going to the bathroom. We are showering. Okay, we are in athletics. So you can't yeah, put us you're, back. I, but no, no one's suggesting that. And you're dodging the question because you don't have an answer. And I just hope that you'll take this seriously because I think it's a serious issue. And I hope that you will, too. It's not just a matter of saying we're here, we're not going away. It's a series of like doing... But you're, you know, saying, the, you're saying until we have a standard, questions. until we have an absolute standard, we can't do anything. And I, so I disagree with that. I'm saying don't give $11 billion away to people who are faking. Like, what are we even talking about? Who's faking? I still don't know. Where's your evidence of faking? Tell okay. me who faked it, and then we can discuss it. Jillian, thanks for joining us. Thank